you're blinking your eyes right now. Are you aware of it? I met Ajahn Jinavamsa while traveling through Asia in search of the source of sati, which is usually called mindfulness in the West. He honored me with hospitality in his hermitage, with openness and kindness. While talking to him, I decided to record a part of our meeting in order to show at least a fragment of his life, his experience and practice. When I met him, he had been living alone for many years on one of the small islands of Sri Lanka, starting each day with a boat trip before sunrise. We go uh, on arms round in the morning. We go to the village or the city and um, we have a ball and we walk around in the, in the village and um, we don't ask for anything. We're not beggars, but um, we just silently, peacefully walk through the village and people uh, know that when they see monks and they have a ball, that um, um, that's the time to uh, practice generosity. And, um, and so people will um, quickly gather some food and offer it to us. And it's very nice because it's, it's, uh, it's both respectful and generous of these people to do that. And also spontaneous quite often. And, um, and so it, it makes uh, people feel, feel happy and glad and joyful. And also for the monk, of course, it's very uh, it's a very good feeling to see these uh, beautiful qualities and uh, we appreciate that. And so it's a very beautiful practice and this is very very old kind of tradition that, that started long 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 before the Buddha even appeared in the world.
occasionally it happens that you this uh, this food is wrapped up in a piece of paper and then I read an interesting story. <laughs> The Buddha established a bunch of rules, and um, one of the rules is that um, when we, uh, when monks eat food, we just eat once or maybe twice. In fact, he, the Buddha never actually allowed us to eat more than once, but uh, he allowed us to eat from dawn until twelve o'clock noon. And um, and the Buddha himself, he used to eat just once and some monks still do, like myself. Uh, other monks have uh, kind of um, uh, adapted that a little bit and they have a breakfast early and then <laughs> they have a lunch before 12. But basically it's all about simplifying the way of life of a monk. Because if you just eat once or twice but in the morning, then it means you have a whole afternoon and a whole evening free. You don't have to um, go through all these uh, difficulties and, and uh, trouble to prepare a meal and to eat it and to wash up and everything, you have a lot of free time. It makes life very simple. And now if you're not used to that and you think, how can a person live on just one meal a day? You know, you, uh, you might think this is a bit unnatural. But actually this is not the case at all. I mean, I for myself, I remember that when I first came to the monastery, I didn't like it so much that, uh, that there was only one meal a day. I thought, I'm going to be hungry every day, that's not nice. But actually, the body can adapt very, very quickly. And in just a few days or a week, your body is already adapted to it. And you don't feel hungry at all. I mean, it's just... Uh, so we have, uh, we have quite a good meal, you know. It's not, not just a small little breakfast and that's it. But we, because we only have one meal, we have a, you know, a, a good meal once a day. And in the afternoon, well, maybe we can have a cup of tea or, t or coffee. But we don't actually consume uh, rice and bread and all that. And so it's basically the, uh, the reasoning behind it or the intention behind it is for simplicity. So that we have a lot of free time. We can really get into our meditation. And uh, we don't have to waste a lot of time with... Um, things like uh, eating and uh, cooking and all that. Well, during the walking meditation, obviously there are also movements and there are movements that you can be aware of. So, when we do the rhythmic meditation, then the awareness is mainly with the movements of the arms and the hands. I say mainly because uh, it's also possible to be aware of, let's say, blinking your eyes. Or if you move your head to the right, to the left, and you're aware of that movement. So we don't fix on just the, the arms and the hands, but mainly you know, maybe 80% of it, is, is, is there with the arms and the hands. Now when you're walking, obviously the, um, the main movements are in the legs, but don't concentrate, don't just stay with the sensation of the, f of the soles of the feet touching the ground, but take your whole body. So any movement uh, that you uh, perceive while you're walking, that's okay. So maybe you notice that I had my hands behind my back. So you might actually feel the, the touch of your hand on your wrist. That's a sensation. <laughs> um, or you might, but you know, most of the um, <coughs> sensations will be in your legs and your feet while you're walking. So, um, you know, you're not, you're not concentrating on just one part of, uh, of the movement. But you're you're open to 
whatever you you sense, what what stands out in the moment. That's what you're aware of. So your your uh, object of awareness actually is changing all the time. So the um, the walking and the sitting, we can alternate. Because if you sit for a long time, then you may you may have uh, pain in your knees. <laughs> of course, when you have pain in your knees, you can move. And while you move from right to left, or you, know, you change your position a bit because you have pain in your knees, you're aware of that. Right? But anyway, after a while, you might want to change your your position, so then you walk for, for a bit. But you still have awareness. And then after you walk for a while, you might get tired. So then you sit down again. But the important thing is to maintain, see if you can maintain your awareness. And then <clears throat> when you um, try to apply this practice in your daily life, you can use your the ordinary movements that are there. So uh, in, the, um, in the formal practice, the, we use intentional movements. Right? We, make, we make these movements intentionally. But when you in your daily life, when you take a bath, obviously there are movements. You take the soap, you rub it on your body. Now those movements you can use. So taking a bath also is meditation. You can be aware of, of the whole process of taking a bath and the, taking the towel and everything. When you open the door, when you close the window, when you get up from your seat, when you brush your teeth, when you wash your clothes, everything. You make tea, all those movements can be used for awareness because any movement basically can be used for awareness even the Buddha said in the in Satipatthana Sutta when you go to the toilet <laughs> and so this practice really can be used continuously from the moment you wake up in the morning until the moment you go to sleep and um, so for example when you are laying down for, to sleep um, you might make a little intentional movement with your fingers. You're touching your fingers like this, in a kind of playful way. Or making a fist, opening your hand, making a fist, opening your hand. It's a little ordinary uh, movement, but there has to be an object for awareness. And that's what you're doing. You, are, you, have, you have an object. It's a little movement, but there's an object for awareness. So then you can practice awareness until the moment you go to sleep. And so this, <clears throat> the continuity, very, very important. We don't practice just for an hour and then we say, okay, now we ring the bell and it's, uh, we stop. There, there, there's, there's no beginning, there's no end. That is to say, that is our intention. I mean, uh, obviously in the beginning you can't do it and you will forget, and you will get lost and then suddenly you realize, Wait a minute, for five minutes, where was my awareness? I completely lost it. <laughs> Never mind, come back again and try to apply it in your, in your daily life as much as you can. When you practice with awareness, there comes a point where you, you actually realize um, what, what happens in the mind when there's awareness. And you, you start to have it, um, and then, you know, you don't see that in the beginning because awareness is so short. It's just a moment. It's not any more than a moment. But when you become more and more familiar with it, you start to notice that um, in awareness there's no thought. It's it's a, it's a, it's kind of like emptiness, or a blank sheet of paper, and um, you know I I actually think in in the Thai language sometimes, and uh, a word that is or a sentence that is really meaningful to me is is uh, the sentence, my mirai my penrai, which means there's nothing in the mind, and there's nothing to identify with. There's no identification. That is kind of what happens when you really become familiar with awareness. There's nothing there. There's nothing. There's nothing in the mind. You could call it the empty mind if you want, if you like. 
and there's nothing to identify with. There's, so there's, I mean, I'm not a monk, I'm not a man, I'm not, I'm not good, I'm not bad, I'm not anything. There's just, there's just this moment. There's nothing there. And then, some, then what will happen? The mind will bring something up, will create something, some thought, some memory, and you, and you, and you see it. You see it. Why? Because there's nothing there, and then suddenly there's something there. <laughs> You see, and that's why I said a few times this simile of this sheet of paper. You've got a white sheet of paper, a blank sheet of paper. There's nothing there, or there's nothing on the paper. But then there's, there's somebody writes a letter. It, well, you see it immediately. That's not a blank sheet of paper anymore. So you, you recognize it and you come back to that blankness. That, but it's not just blankness, it's also freedom. Because you're free of thought. And when you're free of thought, it means you're free of anger, you're free of worry, you're free of desire, you're free of jealousy, you're free of doubt, you're free of the sense of self. The sense of self, this feeling of I am sitting here and you're over there, it's not there all the time, it's only there when you think about it. So when you cut off thought, you cut off the self also. When you cut off thought, you cut off suffering. When you cut off thought, you cut off everything. And so when you experience the, the mind that is empty, where the, there's nothing there, then you have that perspective. And that is the, really the important point. And then things start to change, because now you know how to practice. <laughs> Something arises and you don't believe it anymore. It's just, it's just the mind. And actually, the way I see the mind now is that, now first of all, I, I'm talking about the mind, not my mind. <laughs> the mind is, is, a, is a machine. It's a machine that concocts things. And it's doing that all the time. It's very diligent. Every few seconds it does that. Another thought comes up. Another thought comes up. I'm not asking for these thoughts to come up, but they do. <laughs> and I don't believe any of it. And all of that, I can, I can come back to awareness and have a perspective on it. And so I experience a kind of freedom, which is a kind of happiness, which is, well, I would say it's the best kind of happiness there is. Because, you know, the kind of happiness you might get from meeting somebody you like, or from having a beautiful sunrise, or something like that, well, that's all impermanent kind of happiness. But the happiness that you get from being free, <laughs> what's better than that? <laughs> I feed them every day so they're not really very hungry. can't teach a, a dog or a cat to, to watch their minds because they are ruled by their instincts and uh, so it's, it's impossible, almost impossible to teach them that kind of thing. But they are very alert and they, they really live in the present, you could say. You know, be, why? Because they, they don't think. <laughs> but that is because they haven't got to that point yet. The, the, the evolution hasn't reached that point where they can actually think. Now, as for us, we are stuck on that level of thinking, and we haven't gone beyond it. So, you could say that thinking is just a, a stage in the evolution of sentient beings, and I'm not suggesting that we should fall back below that, 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 that level, but we can, we can go beyond it. And when you do go beyond it, then you can still use it in, in cases where, where it's needed. You know, when you, you need to... Uh, do something on the computer, or you want to talk with somebody, or you want to plan something, uh, okay, do it, and use your intelligence. But uh, as soon as that's over, then you can just be peaceful, and, and, and be clear, and live with awareness. But, you know, this is actually very interesting, because um, I don't think that uh, animals suffer that much. I mean, you can observe that, you know, like a dog, for example. 
when a dog doesn't have much to eat and he's getting very thin, or when a dog has a has a wound, does he go and kill himself, or <laughs> does he, you know, he 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 can he can cope with that basically. He may suffer a little bit, but not as much as we, because he didn't think about it. He didn't think, oh poor me, and what am I going to eat today, and all that. He did, so the the you know maybe eighty percent of the suffering that we experience, where does it come from? It comes from thinking. And so animals don't have that. They still have some suffering, yeah, but they can endure more, much better than we do. Well, the word mindful, I think, is is not such a good description of the word sati. Uh, I, I prefer the word awareness, because mindfulness is, is more like uh, being careful or giving attention, uh, which is something that you can do only for a short span of time. So, I mean, an animal can be alert, an animal can be attentive, an animal can be in the present, sure, of course. But can you teach uh, an, an animal to be aware of the inner world, of, of, of body and mind, what's going on in... No, you can't. The idea that most people have of what, what sati is, uh, is not necessarily correct. But you know, it's not a matter of, 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 of uh, thinking up the right definition or anything like that. Or to argue about, it should be like this, it should be like that, and this teacher says this, and why do you say it like that? It's a, it's a, what, is really, what, what, what it really comes down to is, try it out for yourself, practice with it, experiment. And like say, when I, when I say, uh, raise your arm and be aware. So, well, are you, are you sure that you are aware? Well, what, what, what is that awareness? And can you see the difference between raising your arm and not being aware, and raising your arm and being fully aware? And when you feel that you're, you're definitely fully aware of this movement, because you feel it, you experience it, it's, it's it's direct, it's now, you're aware of it, <clears throat> then what, what actually is taking place in your mind? Is there any thoughts? Is there any label? Is there any like? Is there any dislike? This is it, it, it's very quick. It's only just a moment that you are aware. Now if you can catch that, and if you can see it more and more clearly because you become more and more familiar, then you start to, to recognize what, what the mind is doing when you're aware. And then you can start to see awareness is like this, and when there's a lack of awareness, it's like this. Thinking is like this, when there's no thought, it's like this. Then you start to see that. And that is something that you see for yourself. That's not something that I can explain or you, you can read in a book. That's not something you can put in a definition or anything like that, you know. <laughs> you, have to, you have to do it. If you want, want to know what, what is awareness, what is Sampajanya, what's he talking about? Why is he making such a big fuss about being aware? You have, to, you have to try it out. You have to practice with it. That's the only way. Because otherwise, it's just, you know, it's just an intellectual understanding. I say, ah, oh, now I've got it. Here's the perfect definition of it. No, rubbish. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's rubbish. <laughs> any, any definition would be rubbish. Because it's dead words. But awareness is being alive, being awake. You know, for you, you know, and no matter what anybody says, you know what is awareness. You know whether, whether you're aware or not. You know, if, you, if I raise my arm, I'm aware. If you say you, I'm not, well, that's your, <laughs> that's your opinion, but I know for sure. 
So it's it's through practice and it's through experience that you come to know something. Really, really come to know something, not any other way. But what I've observed it definitely is that awareness it has the characteristic of being open, being in the in the present and directly experiencing and it gives you a feeling of being alive, being awake. The word awake is a very special word. It's it really um, it's it's a waking up experience. And the funny thing is that, that you can use these ordinary little movements to wake up moment by moment. And it's a very joyful thing to do. That's that's maybe also very surprising because you know these just ordinary little movements like that. You know what's 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 so special about that? It's pretty boring. Well, actually, my experience it's it's very joyful. And. You know, it's the wisdom aspect behind this awareness that makes it joyful because you start to see that it's possible to be free of this mind that's that's thinking and going out all the time. It's possible to be free. When you're when you're aware, then you're free. Now this um, this aspect of Buddhism, the, the wisdom aspect, is something that you can study quite a lot. There's lots and lots and lots of books, and um, it's possible to kind of um, read a lot of books and to kind of regard Buddh the Buddhist teachings as a kind of philosophy, and to have uh, you know maybe a very good understanding, but it's a kind of intellectual understanding. And that is missing the point, because it's not at all about having a theory, even if it's right. <laughs> it's not about an intellectual understanding. That's not going to change your life, even if it's very clear, and even if you're you're able to explain the Buddhist teachings to a big audience. But it's about actually experientially seeing it for yourself, so that doubt is cut off. There's no more doubt. You're actually clear about this. You, you see it, that it's true. You see reality as it really is. And, and so it's, it's, it's good to have some, some basic understanding about what those teachings are. So, for example, we have the teachings of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, which is quite a detailed kind of um, sequence of how this, this I arises in the mind. And, and it goes step by step. And then be, once there is an I, then there's a problem. <laughs> but um, to get into a lot of details and to regard this teaching in a, in a kind of intellectual um, way, it, it doesn't really work. So what, what is actually a much more efficient way to do it is to to, de to develop this ability to see clearly. And that is what awareness is all about, is to see clearly. Is to, to, to see, to <clears throat> experience the present moment without any labels, without any thinking, without any liking and disliking, just see what is there. And when you, <clears throat> when you do that, then you, st the, you, you see for yourself that things change, because it's the truth, that things change all the time. And then you, you start to actually you realize that the things that you thought were me and mine, were self, actually you can observe them and see them as an object. So how can an object be me? <laughs> if an object is, you know, if you look at an object, the object is over there. And the person who's looking at the object is over here. So there's, there's a, because of the clear seeing, there's a separation. And that separation that we can call an insight, because then you see that that it's not self. And once once you realize that, then the attachment falls away, 
And now your attitude towards that object becomes very different. And that is what freedom is all about. Freedom, freedom means freedom from attachment. And actually when you look at the scriptures, what is enlightenment? Enlightenment also is, is explained in, in the dropping away of the attachment. Uh, so it's the it's the it's the uh, the freedom of no lo of being able to let go of things and not not attaching anymore. And so it's possible through developing awareness that this insight and this this clear seeing takes place uh, without a lot of study and, and uh, using your uh, in intellectual faculties. So this is um, something that um, is, is quite important to realize that, that, that you know, this study, it's all very interesting, that's true. And there's many books and you can become a real expert. And there's, there's many, many people who, who kind of make that mistake. You know, they read book after book and they even have titles in the Pali language and uh, they think they know a lot, but if you ask, well, are they, are those people um, what we call Aryas? And Arya is a, a person who is one of the stages of enlightenment, because there are actually four stages of enlightenment. And the answer is no, they're not. <laughs> so I would like to stress that um, awareness is what really uh, is, is, is essential, and we, which is really the heart of the practice, not the study of it. So even, and it's, it's, I, can, I can tell you a funny story, I don't know if it's, this is the right time for it, <laughs> but um, there was a man um, who started to practice uh, developing awareness, and um, he was very successful, and uh, after he had been a monk for I think about 10 years or so, he returned to his home village and he started, uh, he established a monastery there. And of course the villagers who lived there, they knew him. They said, ah, that's Jorana, I, I know him from the past, you know. And they didn't have so much faith in this, in this, in this monk because they knew that he wasn't just an ordinary person just like they were before. And now he started to talk about Nibbana and enlightenment and not self and insight and all these kind of things. And they thought, what's all this talk? And there was one man in particular who wanted to try this out. And he said, oh, is that really true? Okay, I'll try it out. You tell me how to practice, I will do everything you say, and then I will prove that all this talk of yours is just nonsense. So this man, he didn't have very good intentions actually, because he wanted to prove that this monk was wrong. But he did it, and so this, the monk, he instructed him, he said, do the sitting meditation and move your arms and be aware, and do the walking meditation, do it like this and do it like that. And this man, he, he did everything he said. And after not so very long, he really started to get some insight. <laughs> and he couldn't stop practicing, he was practicing day, day in, day out, all day long. And in the end, he also ordained as a monk. And he started to be, to uh, become the disciple of this this monk who was his friend before. <laughs> and the funny thing is that now the uh, the original monk who established the monastery he says, you see, this is an example. Even if you don't want wisdom to arise, it will still arise. Why? Because awareness is the cause of it. Awareness means to see clearly. And if you practice in the right way and you do see clearly, well, you can't miss it. And, and wisdom will arise, it has to arise, because awareness is the cause of it. And this is really very meaningful actually, and I've, personally I've talked with, uh, with, uh, with, with this man who wanted to prove that the monk was wrong, and he told me the same thing, and I found it quite an inspiring story. And I thought, you know, all those books that I used to read, and all this kind of contemplation and all that stuff, it's not really all that necessary. And it didn't really help me that much. And it didn't really change my life. And it was interesting, you know, I could tell you about Anatta and about Paticca Samuppada, all that. But actually what's really needed is awareness. Because that is the thing that makes you see things clearly, to see things as they are.
So this um, <clears throat> practice with awareness, awareness of movements, is quite a strange kind of meditation technique because um, we don't sit still. We use movements all the time, from moment to moment. And um, because awareness needs, uh, needs an object. And so there's a um, uh, meditation technique that, technique that has been developed, I think it was originally developed in Burma, but it became popular through uh, a teacher called Lompo Thien in Thailand. And um, <clears throat> this is um, a series of movements, actually there are 14 movements, but you don't have to count them, uh, with the hands and the arms, uh, one after another, very simple ordinary movements. And um, the point is to just feel yourself moving feel the sensations, be aware of what is going on from moment to moment. Feel when you move, feel when you stop. And so your, your mind is constantly engaged in being aware from moment to moment. And because of that, the mind doesn't have much of a chance to think a lot, <laughs> because you only have one mind. And so when your mind is engaged in being aware, then um, the, the thinking uh, diminishes and when it does arise it's quite easy to catch yourself because you know you see hey wait a minute I'm not being aware and so the moment you, you catch yourself well that's actually a moment of awareness already and then of course what you do is you come back to the next moment <clears throat> so every movement is an opportunity to be aware to re-establish your awareness. So even if you lose it every now and then, never mind, but this moment you can be aware. This moment. And every moment is a new moment. So don't make this into kind of one one big movement, you know, because some people they kind of do it a little bit too fast. And then if you don't pause in between the in between the the movements then it becomes like kind of like one big movement. So th I don't advise to do it like that. Also, I don't ad advise to to pause for too long, because then it becomes a bit like a soldier who kind of makes one movement and it, it's kind of a bit unnatural and it becomes a bit like concentration, you know. So to find the the right rhythm, because after all, this is the rhythmic meditation. It's called. <laughs> That's a direct translation from the Thai. So, um, you, from moment to moment, you have the opportunity to re-establish your awareness. And when you do this for a while, like say in a group meeting, you might do this for an hour together, or you know you could do it shorter. It's, it's up to you. But anyway, when you practice this for a period of time, then you know obviously you accumulate many moments of awareness. So, uh, I mean, it could be as much as 3,000 in an hour. And so, if it's, if it's, if it's really awareness, if, you're, if you are aware, your mind is clear, your mind is awake, yeah, that, that is actually a good indication. I mean, if you are doing this practice, and you think, I'm not quite sure if I'm, a, I'm aware or not. I think so, but I'm not sure. Well, ask yourself, 
when you when you're doing it are you is your mind awake is there a sense of being awake is there a sense of being in the present and if the answer is yes then then that's good but if you kind of feel like dull and boring well that's not it that's not awareness <laughs> it's it's a the one characteristic of awareness is that it's it makes you awake and alive and also there's a sense of openness because you don't concentrate so you might still be aware of the dark the the dog barking or um, the wind against your skin or other things which are taking place in the present moment you don't concentrate just on the sensations uh, you can also be aware of uh, what's happening in your mind uh, like or pain in your knees or something like that so your mind is open it's not fixed on just one thing <coughs> But you are building up a habit. It's a very good habit. We we all have <laughs> very bad habits. Like actually thinking is a very bad habit that we have. <laughs> and now we're building up a good habit, the habit of being in the present, of being aware. And whether you know it or not, a habit of stepping out of thought. Because while you, when you are, when you are aware, at that moment there is no thought actually. Now, you may not see that immediately. It may take some time before you actually see that clearly, before that becomes a reality. It's only when you actually see that that becomes a reality. Before that, you know, you might just believe that I, uh, because I say that, but as long as you don't actually see it, it's not really a reality. But at a certain point, you, you start to actually see that, and then you realize that being aware is much more peaceful than thinking. <laughs> And you know you 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 see your way out. You 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 this this mind that has been going on and on and on thinking about this and that and all sorts of rubbish. The, the, it's it's possible to step out of that. And this is very significant because actually when you step out of thinking, it means you step out of duality. In awareness, there is no duality. There's just this. This moment is like this. It's not good or bad, it's this. <laughs> and there's, there's a clarity there. Because you don't try and name it or label it. And so this um, uh, practice, which may, may appear to be quite sort of uh, boring or uh, an ordinary, it is ordinary, is, is actually a very useful way to gradually build up more and more awareness and then also one of the reasons that we do this formal practice is because you can uh, once you have a little bit of a foundation not necessarily a strong foundation but a little bit of a foundation then you can try and apply it into your daily life so when you're eating you know you actually feel the movements when you're drinking something you you you, you whatever movement you make during the day you know, you're chasing away a mosquito, <laughs> you smile, or you yawn, yawning, also a very good meditation object. <laughs> All of that can be used, and they, you, you can actually do that little by little, the more you remind yourself. So, in a way, sati has been uh, defined as, as um, a remembrance. Well, that's okay, but... I would say it's not remembering the past, it's remembering the present. Because what happens when you are caught up in a thought? What, a, what happens when you're caught up in anger or something like that? You forget the present. You forget the reality of this moment. And this moment is what reality is. The anger is not reality, that's, what's some, that's something you created. <laughs> so in a sense, that's, that's just what awareness is. It is remembering the present coming back to the present so really the, the, the in, in very short as conclusion as the bottom line what the practice is it's a coming back again and again and again and again to the present so whether the present is a is a sensation in the body <coughs> or the present is a sound that you hear or the, the present is a is a thought in your mind it's something that you can directly experience that's what awareness is and so we use the formal practice of sitting making the movements with uh, 
the rhythmic meditation and the walking meditation as the basis. And one thing I want to make very clear is that don't get attached to the formal meditation and think only when I do the formal meditation I'm practicing and then when I stop that and uh, I'm not practicing. No. From day one we always say use this awareness in your daily life. When you're washing your clothes, be aware. When you're brushing your teeth, be aware. <clears throat> so integrate it into your daily life. Don't get attached to the formal practice because in other methods that seems to happen quite a lot. You know, people think, okay, I'm going to watch my breath from six to seven, and then I, somebody rings the bell and I stop, and then, and then the meditation's finished. But this is not the way we do it. 